Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for your goodness, your kindness, and your mercy. As always, Lord God, we come before you delighting in the salvation that was purchased on the cross by your Son, who took our sin to give us his righteousness, who died our death to give us his life, who made us new creations by your Spirit, and who left us with his word, your word, and your spirit to speak to us from your word. Let these things, Lord God, not increase our knowledge with the aim of increasing our knowledge, but increasing our knowledge, the aim of making us more conformed to the image and likeness and character of your son and more effective in serving him in his wonderful name, the one who saved us, the Lord Jesus. Amen. We left off yesterday in the book of Isaiah, chapter 5. And sometimes it's good to pick up precisely where you left off. So let's do that. This is the famous... Hineni passage, Hineni, here am I uh, at your service, as it were, Ovotresevis, Hineni in Hebrew. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Now notice God is speaking in the plural. Who is he speaking to? I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? For the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the triunity of the Godhead. Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go tell this people. Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. Then I said, how long? And he answered, until the cities are devastated and without inhabitant and houses are without people and the land is utterly desolate, making a reference, of course, to the Babylonian captivity. The northern kingdom had already gone into the Assyrian captivity. In 721, he speaks of the Babylonian captivity impending in 585 B.C. And again, the rise of the Babylonian Empire in the Old Testament is a type, a shadow of the rise of Babylon the Great in the book of Revelation. The Lord has removed men far away and the forsaken places are in the midst of it. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and again be subject to burning like a tabernacle of an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. No matter how backslidden Israel was, the Lord always kept a remnant. He always kept a remnant. That was the holy seed. Zara in Hebrew. The idea of seed having the implicit connotation that it could reproduce, blossom into something in the future. Israel would again become a fruitful vine. Now we know that Jesus quoted this passage in John chapter 12 from Isaiah. John 12 puts it down in the Septuagint from the Greek version of Isaiah. But essentially it says... They would not believe, they should not believe, they could not believe. When people continually, pathologically resist what they know to be the truth, when they continually and pathologically resist what they know to be the truth. This is frightening. In the Antichrist passage of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
the Lord will send a deluding influence to make them believe what is false. The Lord put a lying spirit into the mouth of King Ahab's prophets. I'll make you believe the lie. You persist in believing lies? You persist in rejecting what you know to be the truth? <clears throat> I'll give you over to it. You would not. So you should not. Now you could not. Now you can't believe. Yet Isaiah was told to tell them this. What a message. The only glimmer of hope was for the 10%. The holy stump after the tree is cut down that could blossom again. Reminding us of Daniel's prophecy of King Nebuchadnezzar. He leaves the stump, something that had the potential to grow again in the future, but gets rid of it. So let's talk about <clears throat> the stump. Let's talk about what is left in an age and a time when the people of God are going headlong to Babylon, when they don't want to know the truth any more. The truth doesn't matter to them anymore. As it says in 2 Thessalonians, they do not love a knowledge of the truth. Remember, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the incarnation of the divine Logos. Thy word is truth. No matter what they say to you, no matter what they tell you, if people do not love the teaching of Scripture, they do not love Jesus Christ. They have a different Jesus. Maybe they have the plastic one on the dashboard or something like this, or one of their own fictitious imagination. But people who do not love sound doctrine, who do not love the rightly divided word of God and what it means, they don't love Jesus Christ. No matter what they say, they might talk about love and all this. They don't love Jesus. They don't love Jesus. If they did, they'd believe the scriptures. If you love me, keep my commandments. And we see this all the time. We see this all the time. They attempt to make love and truth mutually exclusive. When in fact, we're told again by Paul, as I mentioned last night, love and truth are mutually dependent. When you stand up and say what something is, you don't have the love of Jesus. Let's look at Jesus. Let's look at Jesus with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. He was more open with her at that point than he was with his own disciples despite the hostility between Jews and Samaritans. And he's talking to her, and they seem to have a lot in common. Our father Jacob, well, they believed in the patriarchs. Same God. We believe the Messiah is coming. Then Jesus comes, tells her, I am he. Oh, she believes in Jesus. She believes in the same God. But she was a Samaritan. The Samaritans rejected the teaching of the Hebrew prophets. They only accepted the Torah, except that they changed the bits of Torah that they didn't like, <laughs> that they didn't agree with, to make Mount Gerizim the location of the temple instead of Mount Zion. So as soon as she begins, your fathers have this mountain, our fathers have, you know, that we have this mountain, Jews have that mountain. And John 4, this was not an argument about real estate. It was an argument about where is sin atoned for? <laughs> Which scripture is right? 
Is it the Samaritan bastardization of the Torah? Or is it the Torah? Why don't you accept Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel? <clears throat> oh, but she believed in Jesus and he was so loving with her. Notice, as soon as she began with her false doctrine, as soon as she began with her Samaritan beliefs, woman, you know not that of which you speak. Salvation comes from the Jews. They've got the truth. He made her deal with the truth before he went any further in the conversation or in his relationship with her. Did Jesus compromise truth in the name of love? No. Let's look at the Syrophoenician woman with the demon-possessed little girl. Jesus made statements if taken out of context could appear racist, ethnically bigoted. A common Jewish metaphor for pagans was dogs, kravim. A poetic metaphor prophetically, Psalm 22, dogs surround me, kravim. Now, in the Greek, it's diminutive. I can't give the children's bread like, like puppies. <laughs> they use the term of affection for dogs, but Jesus was basically saying something. I can't give what belongs to the Jews, to dogs. Now, Jesus loved that little Syrophoenician girl just as much as he would have loved a little Jewish girl. But before he went any further in the conversation, he made that woman deal with the reality. Your religion is unfit for human consumption. It is dog food. Talmudic Judaism is not scriptural Judaism. It's dog food. Roman Catholicism is not scriptural Christianity. It is dog food. It's not fit for people made in God's image and likeness for whom Christ died. It's fit for dogs. The teachings of the Watchtower and Jehovah's Witness, it's fit for dogs. The Koran is dog food. The Book of Mormon is dog food. The Bhagavad Gita is dog food. It's only fit for dogs. You're a human being made in the image and likeness of God. You're not a dog. Why are you eating kennel ration? He made her deal with the issue of the doctrine before he could help her and help her little girl, didn't he? Never did Jesus compromise truth in the name of love. On the contrary, because he loved, he told the truth. Now, being gracious about it, being sensitive how we put it across, being led of the Holy Spirit, above all, yes, we can look at those things. <laughs> but we can never look at the need to speak the truth in love. If you don't speak the truth, you don't speak with the love of Jesus. There was a famous theologian in this city, a reformed one, J.I. Packer, from Regents College here in British Columbia. Only stating a fact. There was a book written by somebody called Peter Kreeft called Ecumenical Jihad. He sees Mohammed in heaven and all this stuff. And Peter Kreeft writes that we have to have ecumenical union with Islam in order to morally redeem society. The American 
political criminal who says he was born again. I'm not his judge, he's dead now, Chuck Colson. And among others, your own J.I. Packer from this city, the famous professor from Regents, theologian cum laude, the Calvinistic scholar of Vancouver, endorsed that book on the cover. Endorsed the book saying that saved Christians should have ecumenical union with Islam in order to morally redeem society. There are people who will hear what I just said. They will not deny the factual accuracy of what I just said. They will not respond rationally. They will simply say, on the basis of emotion which they think with, they replace their logic with their emotions and imagine it to be spiritual. You're unloving, you're judgmental, you're critical. By your ridiculous religious standards, so was Jesus Christ. You don't love him. Whatever your religion is, J.I. Packer, please don't call it Christianity. Find another name for it. I'm the Lord your God. You'll have no gods before me, including the Nabataean moon god. You got a tenth. A tenth. Let's understand some of the characteristics about this tenth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul tells us the kind of people most likely to get saved. He tells us that the poor are more likely to get saved than the affluent that the simple are more likely to get saved than the clever, than the formally educated. He tells us that the disenfranchised are more likely to get saved than the powerful. This is not to say people of wealth, power, and education cannot get saved. It just means it's less likely. The more assets you have, according to the economy and calibration of the fallen world, the less likely you are to turn to Christ. People of wealth, power, education have a greater incentive to trust in this life. More than that, while there is nothing wrong with wealth, power, or education, <clears throat> and once taken to the cross and redeemed, can be used for God's purposes, Outside of Christ, the natural grounds for pride and a false sense of self-sufficiency that leads to eternal perdition. But that's in terms of the gospel, in terms of people being saved. Let's look at the tenth who would remain. Jeremiah, who would follow Isaiah, wrote that after the four invasions of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, it was only the poor of the land who remained to cultivate the vines, wrote Jeremiah. Look with me, please, if you will, to Nehemiah chapter 3. Moreover, next to him, the Tekoites made repairs, but their nobles did not support the work of their masters. Do not expect much participation from the nobility. The people of power and privilege in the church behave like the people of power and privilege in the world. They're always looking for what side of the bread the butter is. Do not expect much from prominent members of the church. Do not expect people 
who have positions of leadership, who have positions of Christians in the community, do not expect many of them to join in the work. That's not their priority. But let's look at another characteristic. Turn with me, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 22. So David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. In an age of decline, most people will remain loyal to the house of Saul, not to the house of David, who's a type of Christ. Look what it says in verse 2. Everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented gathered to him. And he became captain over them, about 400 men with him. It was the people who were broke. It was the people who were maxed out on their credit cards. It was people who had nothing to lose. They lost it already. It was people whose careers and professions and businesses were going nowhere fast. They understood the decline coming upon the nation and where King Saul, as a backslidden leader, was taking them. It was the down and outs who came to David. For the most part, it will be the down and outs who come to Jesus. Once more, don't expect too much from the high and mighty. Now, let's talk a little bit about the high and mighty. We know that unless the Lord builds a house, it cannot stand the laborer's labor in vain. It can build a house, but you cannot make it stand. It's entirely possible to build a house. You can build a big one. You can replace worship with entertainment. You can replace anointing with hype. You can replace exposition of God's word with motivational psychology. And you can build a big house doing those things based on the principles of secular marketing that Rick Warren admitted he got from the unsaved marketing guru, Peter Drucker. He admitted it. Find out what kind of a church people want. Do the market research and give it to them. You can build a house based on that stuff. But you can't make it stand. Let's look at some realities. As a young Christian, I remember the biggest ministry in the world at that time. The biggest ministry in the world. Television, satellite TV in the early days, radio, a mega church, and if you can believe it, the third biggest theme park in the world a Christian theme park, the third biggest, after Disneyland and Universal City, it was the next biggest, called Heritage USA. The PTL Club, Jim and Tammy Baker, the biggest evangelical, quote-unquote, ministry in the world. They built it. But in one day, one day, I remember here in Canada, there was a Mecca, a Mecca of lunacy, 
a mental asylum with a cross on the roof next to the airport, next to Pierce Airport in Toronto. People were flocking there from Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, coming to get the blessing. Too ignorant to know what they were doing is neo-Montanism. That's the theological term. Pretending it was a revival. This is it. This is it. This is it. Forget about the fact that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. They were out of control. Forget about all that. I had people tell me I blasphemed the Holy Spirit because I said it was not a true revival. In Great Britain, I had 600 Pentecostal ministers at a conference praying against me, giving me over to Satan. They said, if you went to Toronto, you wouldn't be so judgmental if you experienced the blessing. <clears throat> well, I happened to have been in Toronto on other business, and I decided to drop by. And I went in there, not to get the blessing, I just wanted to take up their challenge. And I went in there, and it was the usual vineyard-type worship. And then the chap opens the Bible, and he says, I am the way. <laughs> the truth! <laughs> and thousands of people crack up in drunken hysterics while the word of God is openly mocked. The words of Jesus were ridiculed. Not long before that I'd been on a mission in Asia. I was on an island in Indonesia. And uh, I saw terrible demonic possession of people who would eat glass and things like this and their gums wouldn't bleed. And I saw the stuff and I saw the way they were manifesting. I'm telling you, I saw people in that church in Toronto doing the same thing I saw in the jungle in Indonesia. As we said yesterday, the fruit of the Spirit is a crate, self-control. I couldn't control it. I couldn't control it. It must be God. By virtue of the fact you couldn't control it proves prima facie it can't possibly be God. When the Spirit of the Lord comes at me, hallelujah, I have to prophesy. When I have the Spirit on me, I have to prophesy. You have to prophesy. No, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. It's two things you needed to get rid of to get the blessing. The first was the scripture, and the second was your brain. Well, what became of the airport vineyard church of John Arnott and Guy Chevro, who wrote the book, Catch the Fire? What became of it? Thousands of people coming to this Mecca of madness. Thousands and thousands from all over. This is exactly what happened with the Montanists in the early church. In Papuza. Then it became Toronto. What became of the air? What's left of the airport vineyard church? It was so nuts, even Wimber kicked it out. The vineyard movement disenfranchised it. What's there now? It had a clone in the United States. That clone was in Pensacola, Florida. They had the vibrating girl. Kirkpatrick says, I know this is of God because I know her family. She comes from a good family. No, she came from a broken home. He lied. 
Michael Brown was the apologist for Pensacola as Guy Chevro was the apologist for the counterfeit revival in Toronto. It ends in a financial scandal and in a big, ugly split. What is left of Pensacola? The first megachurch built on marketing. The harbinger of the megachurch movement. The patriarch of it. That would later be imitated by such luminaries as Rick Warren and Bill Hybels in Chicago. Was Robert Schuller's Crystal Cathedral near Los Angeles? Mega church. They had like a drive in movie where you go into the car park and you put the speakers into them. You wouldn't believe it. That place was amazing. Robert Schuller said when the Pope came to Los Angeles at the height of the pedophile protection scandal, we need to go to the Holy Father and ask him the way home. Jesus said, call no man your father. One is your father who's in heaven. You're telling me a man is my Holy Father? Doesn't the word of God mean anything? He had the um, imam, the grand mufti of Damascus, Syria, one of the most important clergymen in the Middle East, in Sunni Islam, the Grand Mufti, it's like the Archbishop or the Cardinal of Damascus in his pulpit at the Crystal Cathedral. And Schuller stood up and said, I would not object if my grandchildren became Muslim. We have to ask the Pope the way home. Well, the Pope was home. The Roman Catholic Church bought that place for a song. It went to the wall, 56 million U.S. dollars in debt, about 65 million Canadian. Flat broke, and the Roman Catholic Church bought it for $2.50. The Pope is home. Just give him the keys, Mr. Shula. That's the first megachurch. Or you can build a house. You can build it on marketing and compromise and false doctrine. You can build it. But it cannot stand the Crystal Cathedral. I can give you multiple examples. Lakeland, Florida was another one. Another good citizen of your country who was criminally convicted by sexual pedophile says he got saved, and after he got saved, he got covered with tattoos on his face and his neck. Not that I have a problem with Christians who have tattoos, but this guy was nuts. He was banned from going into Australia because a video was seen by the Australian government where he kicked an old lady in the face. The British government would not give him a visa to go to Great Britain. He's down there. And Bill Johnson, Rick Joyner, the late Peter Wagner from the New Apostolic Reformation, and Chehan lay hands on him. And they prophesy over the tattooed goon that he's going to lead the great revival. 48 hours later, 48 hours later, he leaves his Canadian wife who's handicapped. He leaves a handicapped, physically handicapped wife 
here in Canada. His three children, and he takes off with this woman who he's been having an adulterous relationship with. When Peter Wagner and Bill Johnson and Rick Joyner prophesied over him. 48 hours later. He goes to Hawaii on his honeymoon. Leaving his rightful wife and his children here. Then he comes back and he says, I was getting visitations from an angel named Emma. Find me a female angel in Scripture. But now he's getting visions from a new angel called International Banker. That's what he said on television. And Rick Joyner rehabilitates him. Then he's back on television with his harlot wife. The adulteress he's married to, unscripturally, and she's prophesying with him. They're living in whoredom in the eyes of Christ. He's got a sick wife and three little kids in Canada. Lakeland. A few months ago, another Mecca met its fate. I once met this guy in Chicago briefly. It was incredible. The pastors were all coming to him to learn how to do church. I speak of Bill Hybels. He had a pastor's conference annually in his church. He'd get 5,000 pastors. I know one or two who went. His keynote speaker during the Lewinsky scandal was Bill Clinton. Talking about leadership to Christian pastors. You remember Bill Clinton? Depends on what the definition of is is. I did not have sex with that woman, him. I can say more, but I don't want to get vulgar. Clinton had twice, not once, but twice, vetoed the congressional ban on partial birth abortion. Even pro-abortion members of Congress voted to outlaw partial birth abortion. Late-term abortion, where you pull the fetus through the birth canal, do a suboccipital puncture, insert a suction catheter, and suck the baby's brains out of its cranium when it's trying to be born. Brutal murder. In the clinical process, it was not even prepartum. The baby was actually coming through the birth canal when they when they did it, when they do it. Obama also voted for it in the state senate of Illinois. When Congress banned it, Cleta and Clinton vetoed it twice. Who could be more fit? to address 5,000 evangelical pastors on leadership. Bill Hybels had him. Not one of those worthless 5,000 worthless hirelings, not one of those hirelings at the Q&A session challenged Clinton over the veto of partial birth abortions. Not one of those stinking, worthless hirelings, including pastors of Calvary Chapel, who I know, and who are still in the pulpits they have no right to be in. Well, if you've been reading the newspapers or watching the news on the internet, You know what's become of Willow Creek and Bill Hybels.
and his personal immorality. And then the woman who they had to succeed him as pastor, she lasted three weeks. This is where evangelical pastors were going to learn how to have big ministries. What has become of Willow Creek? Toronto, Lakeland, Willow Creek, PTL Club, Pensacola, Pepsi-Cola, Root Beer, 7-Up, take your pick, unless the Lord builds a house, it can not stand. The laborers labor in vain. You can build it. You can have a maverick ministry and you can get a big church. You can build it. But you cannot make it stand. Sooner or later, sometimes sooner than later, This is reality. What's left once the mighty tree is cut down? Once the dead sequoia is felled? What's left when the mighty oak is chopped to the ground? A stump. But the stump has a future. That which is chopped down is firewood. It's going to be burned up. It's only the stump that matters. That's all. Let's talk about this stump. Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near, the day referring to the day of the Lord that is inaugurated by the rapture and resurrection, the parousia, that is the return of Christ. The author of Hebrews is using a hermeneutical technique called Kalvahomer from the Midot of Rabbi Hillel in which St. Paul the Apostle was schooled as a disciple of Gamaliel. Call the homer, light to heavy. Something true in a light situation takes on an expanded dimension of importance in a heavy situation. In other words, things that are always true become particularly true, vitally true in the last days. There's always been false prophets. But in the last days, their numbers multiply. Okay. Understanding the scripture is always important. But in the last days, none of the wicked will understand. It becomes vital to have oil in your lamps to see in the dark. Well, here in Hebrews 10.25, call the homer. Fellowship is always important. Koinonia, shoot the foot in Hebrew, hitabrut. But in the the last days, it becomes essential to survival. I can't find the church. They're all nuts. They're either into the Bill Johnson thing, or they're ecumenical, or they're gone into hyper-Calvinism. I can't find the church. Forsake not the fellowshiping together one with another, 
especially as you see the day approaching. Yesterday at the airport in Los Angeles, Marco and myself tried to share our faith with a uh, nice lady, a Greek-American lady, born in Greece, who pushed wheelchairs for handicapped passengers. And we're talking to her, and she was a little bit impressed that I, I, I couldn't speak, I can't speak Greek, but I knew terms and words and things that she recognized from her Greek Orthodox Church. That's the problem with Bible colleges and seminaries. They only teach you how to read Greek. As far as speaking it, I couldn't order a takeaway souvlaki from an all-night shawarma joint in Plaka. But I knew about the Eastern Fathers and Chrysostom and things like this, and she was a little bit impressed that I knew about Eastern Orthodox religion, having lived in the Middle East for years and so forth. Well, anyway, we kept talking to her, and she kept talking about her church and showing us pictures of her church. I tried to explain to her, listen, you know Greek better than I do. Ecclesia, Ecclesia, the called out ones. The church or the people who are called out. It's not the building where they meet. Her concept of church was a building. And in Eastern Orthodoxy, they believe the idea, they were more mystical and superstitious than Roman Catholicism. They believe the icon as a metaphysical window into the spiritual realm. Stuff that's nuts, but anyway. And what's really crazy is they go back to the Desert Fathers with trying to construct an atmosphere of spirituality, pseudo-spirituality, with candles and incense and things like this and icons. And, and the emergent church people imitate it. With the labyrinths, they, they imitate this stuff. You'd think that they would go back to the book of Acts or to the New Testament to try to restore Christianity. They're going to the early Dark Ages. They're going back to the Byzantine Empire. This is the emergent church. Another joke. So we're talking to this woman, and her whole mindset was, it's a building! And an episcopal, epi around scopo, who looks over, translated bishop, the priest. You gotta have the building, you gotta have the priest, you gotta have the bishop. That's the church to her. It's an institution. Talk to a Roman Catholic. The church to them is the pedophile protecting institution. It's the institution. As you may have heard me say on the internet or on our recorded teachings, every false religion worships the ism. Muslims do not primarily worship Allah. They worship Islam. Jehovah's Witnesses don't worship Jehovah. They worship the Watchtower Society. Mormons don't worship Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They worship the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They worship the ism. The institution, even the building none of which has anything whatsoever to do with any scriptural concept or definition of church. Well, where do we go? We can't find the church. No, you can't find the building. You can't find a denomination or a movement anymore. There may be good Baptists, but the Baptists as a whole have gone the way of all of them. 
there are individual good Pentecostal congregations or brethren congregations or Mennonite congregations. I don't say there are not good individual congregations getting fewer in number. But the movements and the denominations, they're shot to Gehenna. Once Chuck Smith, who was a friend of mine, went to be with the Lord, the Calvary Chapel movement folded like a cheap suit. His church in Costa Mesa, California, near L.A., is not even a Calvary Chapel. No! You can't find the church? Or is it that you can't find the building? Where should we go? Where did the early brethren go? Where did the first Baptists go? Where in the days of John Wesley did the Methodists go? Where did the Jewish believers in the book of Acts excommunicated from the synagogue go? Where do they go? Go home. If you cannot find a scripturally based church within a reasonable distance of where you live, go home. This idea of church that is defined institutionally? You know what a denomination is? In case you haven't heard me say it? A denomination is a tax-deductible property trust and a superannuation fund for the retirement of its clergy. That's what a denomination is. It is a financial and legal institution. This is the way it works. One faith, one baptism. When you have fellowships, wherever they meet, that love Jesus and are scripturally based, they are united by the Holy Spirit on the basis of common doctrine. All you have is a fellowship of fellowships. They may cooperate together on things like missions or theological education, but all you have is a fellowship of fellowships. Once the unity of the Spirit goes and they fragment doctrinally, what they inevitably, inevitably tend to do is to replace the unity of the Spirit with a unity based on legal, financial, and institutional organization. That becomes the church. It's not what the Word of God calls the church. But it's what they call the church. I've had it. I'm going home. Well, okay. But now let's look at what happens when you go home. These are the caveats you have to look out for.
So, you find a small group of like-minded believers and you begin meeting in a home. Good. But remember, whenever God inaugurates a new thing, the devil attacks it. The first thing to look out for, the first device of the wicked one that will cause this new thing that the Lord is birthing to be a stillbirth, that will cause it to be a miscarriage, is introspection. The right mentality has to be, they are getting it wrong, they've gone away from the word of God. Okay. Therefore, we have to, by God's grace, get it right. Once you see a home group of people that have come out of bad churches and denominations getting introspective, they may as well get a shovel and bury it. It becomes a 12-step program of people who've been burned in bad churches. Their fellowship is not based on what God is wanting to do now. But they become hyper-focused on what's wrong with where they came from. That becomes the raison d'etre. That's what they talk about. Sometimes that's all they talk about. They bring their baggage with them instead of leaving it outside. It becomes like Alcoholics Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, 12-step program. It becomes a place where people come and whinge about how they've been hurt and burned in a bad church. Yeah, we know that. But that cannot be the focus or the purpose. It must be they got it wrong. We have to learn from their mistakes and get it right. Introspection will kill the new thing. Second, different translations translated differently. We'll just take an old-fashioned one from the King James. Turn with me, please, to the book of Daniel, chapter 11. Verse 34. When they fall, they'll be granted a little help. And many will join with them in hypocrisy. Many. In this new group, in this proliferation of house churches,
because someone is against what you are against, because they are against what we are against, by no means, by no means indicates automatically that they are for what we are for. There are people who will fall out in any church they go to. As long as they see your new house group as a sounding board, as a platform to give amplification to their own grievances, they're very enthusiastic. But they have their own agenda. And their agenda is not the agenda of Christ. It becomes, once again, virtually inevitable that people like this are going to get in. And the devil is going to try to use them. Oh, they are against what we are against. But they're not for what we are for. They have an agenda. This will happen. It's going to happen. There's no point going on and on about the old thing. We know. We talked about that already. Let's talk about the new thing. God forbid the new thing should wind up in the same rubbish heap as the old thing. And it surely will if we don't look out for these things. Let us continue. I have to invent a word to express it. I don't know, there may be a word, I just don't know what it is. Idiocentric hermeneutics emphasize the idiot. <laughs> Turn with me, please, to Second Peter. Chapter 1, verse 19. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. That's the word of God, a lamp to my feet, light to my path, Psalm 119, 105, etc., until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. This has an eschatological overtone pointing to the return of Jesus, or hinting at it. Know this first of all. First of all, get this right. No prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. with lack of a pastor or a teacher. You've got these refugees from bad churches congregating in a home. 
Maybe a few families. That's it. And this happens. Some people even encourage it. They sit around in a circle and they read a passage of scripture and they discuss it. This is what it means to me. <laughs> I believe the Lord is saying this. And they call it sharing. It's not a matter of one's own interpretation. You've got to deal with the objective, doctrinal meaning theologically, before you make personal application. Any personal application, what some people call a rhema, though that's a debatable term, must be predicated upon the objective doctrinal meaning of the Logos. When people begin discussing a passage of Scripture, interpreting it different ways, assigning their own subjective meaning, you're in big trouble. You may not know you're in quicksand, but you're in quicksand, and you will sink quickly. Now, you can get out of quicksand. You can get out of quicksand. Providing you know you're in it. It is quicksand. This is what it means to me. I would just like to share what the Lord showed me. It's not sharing. It's religious babbling. Now you can speak of a testimony or relate in a way the Lord may have quickened the particular passage of Scripture to your life, to your personal situation and bring it before the body for prayerful consideration. <laughs> you can do that. But if you're going to bring it before the group, the group is obligated in Corinthians to analyze it and see if it's right. There's safety and an abundance of counselors. Iron sharpens iron. We can all get misled. Now, the Lord may show you something, apply a scripture for your personal situation in a certain way. But that is not its primary meaning. The primary meaning is objective, not subjective. That must be first established before you can apply anything personally. This is swimming in the quicksand. This is what it means to me. Well, it may be what it means to you, but it's not what it means. Now, there are other things that can go wrong. There are other weapons in the devil's arsenal for attacking house groups and house churches. But these are the first three to look out for. Any one of them will kill the new thing. But the synergistic combination of them, you're wasting your time. It's not a new thing. It's just a different version of the old thing. That's all. That's all. Get 
these three things right. How much time do I have, Blair? 10, 20 minutes? Look with me, please, to the book of Acts. We have a teaching we did some time ago called The Fundamentals of Ecclesiology. You may be interested to listen to it sometime. It is available online, I believe. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Nassim v'niflaot. However, in John chapter 10, when the people saw the Nassim v'niflaot, the signs and wonders, they tried to stone Jesus. For which one of these signs or wonders are you stoning me? But it says he went to the wilderness where John preached, and although John did no miracles, many believed in him there. There are two dangers, both of which must be avoided. There is a tendency of people who were burned in hyper-charismatic and ultra-Pentecostal churches where the gifts of the Spirit were counterfeited to toss the, proverbi the proverbial baby out the window with the proverbial bathwater and become cessationist. They buy into the John MacArthur Bill of Goods, overlooking the fact that John MacArthur teaches it will be possible to worship the Antichrist, take the mark of the beast, and still get saved in direct contradiction to Revelation 14, 11, and 24. That John MacArthur himself is a false teacher with some very dangerous doctrine. Very dangerous. First Corinthians chapter 1 verse 7. That you are not lacking any charismata until the revelation of Christ Jesus. That word is charismatic gift. These gifts are to continue to operate until Jesus comes. Admittedly, most of what we witness today is not authentic. But a counterfeiter will only counterfeit real money. The devil would not be corrupting and counterfeiting these things. if they were things that didn't exist or had no value. It is irrational. There are those who attempt to say the revelation there, the words apocalypse, that means the book of Revelation. Once the book of Revelation is written by the last apostle, that's it. No, no. It does not say ho apocalypse in Greek. It just says apocalypse. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. In other words, the apocalypse, the revelation, is not the book. It's what's predicted in it. <laughs> you understand? They redefine apocalypse to mean something different than the scripture means. Then they say... When I was a child, I did the things of a child, but now we have the Word of God, the canon of Scriptures completed. Therefore, the perfect has come, and we don't need these things. We only need love. 
Well, if the perfect has come, read the exegetical context of 1 Corinthians 13. If the perfect has come, we no longer need hope, and we no longer need faith. We don't see through a glass darkly. We see as he sees us. That hasn't happened yet. I know that's why we need faith. <laughs> you don't need hope. Oh, we have to have the blessed hope. No, you don't. The perfect has come. It's not even a rational argument, let alone an exegetically coherent one. A lot of these things were formulated by somebody called Benjamin Warfield. Because of the counterfeit spirituality of Roman Catholicism in the Middle Ages, the reformers were adverse to these things, and that's how they got it from church tradition. Now again, there's no new revelation doctrinally. There's no new doctrinal revelation. And anything that God reveals must be based and predicated solidly upon what is doctrinally revealed. They don't understand it. They're confused. Are there apostles now? Yeah. But not like Peter, James, and John. They saw Jesus, and they were inspired to write the New Testament. What kind of apostle exists now? Apostolo, one who was sent out. Church planting missionaries. It will be the same Greek word. Team of people sent out by one church to plant another one in a mission field. That's the Greek word. That kind of apostle still exists. But not like Peter, James, and John. Prophets? Oh, there's prophets. There's prophets in the New Testament. But not like Isaiah or Amos or Habakkuk. They wrote the canon of the Hebrew Scriptures. As soon as they, oh, you think there's apostles and the prophets. What, in their ignorant mind, they think that you mean prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah or apostles like Peter and Paul. Well, let's go back now. Let's look at the other side of the coin. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke. In Luke's Gospel, we read in chapter 5. That the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. The power was present for him to perform healing. The power had to be present. Because he was God, Jesus could have objectively gone around healing people. But he didn't. There was a kenosis. He subjected himself to a nature like ours. According to Philippians chapter 2, never once did Jesus use his divine power. Satan was trying to get him to use his divine power in the temptation narrative, to act out of concert with his father. Anything Jesus did, he did by the Holy Spirit, never in his own strength, even though he could have. The dunamis, the power, had to be present for him to perform healing. We can pray for sick people and anoint them with oil. Okay? 
You can do that. But if you're going to command somebody to get out of a wheelchair or a deathbed or command a terminal disease to disappear, the Holy Spirit has to be empowering you in that given situation or it's not going to happen. You can't go around prophesying. The Holy Spirit has to come on you and give you that prophecy. You can't go around praying in tongues. The Holy Spirit has to give you that tongue in that situation. Or it's not real. So you have the Neomontanists, the Charismaniacs on one extreme. And you have the Cessationists on the other. I have seen cases where Christians were brought up in cessationist churches. They came into the baptism of the Holy Spirit or something of this nature and began to operate in charismatic gifts and they were off the rails. On the other hand, I've seen people who were burned in these lunatic churches to turn to cessationism. Both are errors. Give place to neither one. Let's look again at Acts chapter 2. Verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Continually devoting themselves to it. As we know, the real proof of the pudding, to borrow the colloquialism, is not what happens in here. It's what happens out there when we go back to work with unsaved people and we're stuck in a traffic jam, etc., etc., etc. To hear the teaching is one thing. To be devoted to it is to live it. That's the challenge. But let's look. Notice the teaching came first. The doctrine, the didaskin. A correct scriptural, doctrinal, theological foundation must come first. If the doctrine's wrong, other things are going to go wrong. Get the doctrine right. When Paul, as a senior pastor, was encouraging and instructing as a mentor, a younger pastor named Timothy, the first thing Paul tells Timothy is, speak the things fitting for sound doctrine. Get the doctrine right. John the Baptist pointed the people back to the Torah. The Hebrew prophets pointed the people back to the Torah. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was pointing people back to right doctrine, to the spirit of the Torah. If the doctrine is not right, nothing else is going to be. Oh, we just have to love and sing. I can do that at Clancy Saloon. And to fellowship. 
Fellowship is an interesting word in Greek koinonia, but in Hebrew, hitabrut, you know what it means? Bricks cemented together. Suppose you walked into a church building and there were big holes in the wall. And you say, where's the missing bricks? There's holes in a wall. People say, there they are, in the middle of the floor. <laughs> what good are they there? In most churches, 15% of the people do 85% of the praying. 15% of the people do 85% of the witnessing and evangelism. 15% of the people do 85% of the giving. 15% of the people do 85% of the ministry. They are in fellowship. The others are bricks in the middle of the floor. They come to church, but they don't come to fellowship. Hitabrut is bricks cemented together. To the apostles teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. In reaction to the transubstantiation and idolatry of the Roman mass, evangelical Protestants have downplayed the centrality of the Lord's Supper. It is a huge subject in itself. It is the centerpiece of our fellowship and worship. It is both a memorial of what he did, remember his death until he comes. Until he comes. When Jews eat the Passover, they look back to the Exodus. They look forward to the coming of the Messiah. When Christians take the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians tells us it's our Passover. We look back to Calvary and the resurrection, but we look forward to the return of Jesus. The Lord's Supper is an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Much can be said about it. If you eat and drink the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, we can bring judgment on ourselves. It keeps us in repentance mode. It keeps us dealing with the old nature because when we come to that table, we can be eating and drinking either blessing or judgment. The Roman Mass is a cup of demons. The apostles forbade and condemned the consumption of blood and they believe the wine is transubstantiated into blood. It's a Dracula religion. If you really believe it, it's his blood while you're drinking it. Who are you, Bela Lugosi? But let's look. Enter prayer. They held all things in common. Some people have tried to make this into a model of Christian socialism. Ron Sider in England, Tim Keller in the United States. Understand this. When the need emerged, the believers did that. But God put an end to it in the book of Acts, didn't he? He put an end to it. Oh, they sold all they have and get... Look, if, if Jesus Christ told you Vancouver was going to be destroyed, but you could be rescued, put your house on the market, would you do it? <laughs> they knew Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. They sold it. This place is finished. Nothing is going to show our attitude towards the Lord more than our attitude towards money and material wealth. Where your heart is, your treasure will be also. My favorite rabbi said that. Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef Minet said it. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Where your heart is, your treasure will be also. That's true. Put your money where your mouth is. 
but there were people who wanted to live communally. Let me follow you. You told the Genstri, no, you stay here. Told the woman at the well, no, you stay here. It is not God's will for believers to live that way all the time in all circumstances. Now, places of persecution, that I go in Vietnam, people live like that. The circumstances dictate it. The danger is the church becomes a welfare check to people. They stop work, the church will take care of them. Paul warns about this. If you don't work, don't eat. But let's look. Day by day with one mind in the temple, breaking bread and house to house. Do you see that? In the temple and house to house. Ecclesiologically, there is a dual format. There are things you can do in houses you cannot do in a larger group. Seven times the New Testament calls the church the temple, using various Greek words, oikos, hegios, naos, heron, we're the temple. This is the temple. House group was house to house. There are things that can be done in larger groups that cannot be done in smaller ones. You want to have guest speakers with gifts of teaching and things like this? Well, those guys can't be going around to houses all the time. You've got to get them together in the temple. Like this, do a conference. You can do things in a larger group you can't do in a small one. Conversely, you can do things in a small group you will never do in a large one. You will never discover and develop your gifts in a big group. It begins in a small group. People's gifts are discovered and developed in small groups, not in big ones. The intimacy of the Lord's Supper, it's not wrong to take it in a large group. But real fellowship happens in a small group. There are things that can be done house to house that could never be done in a conference. There are things that can be done in a conference that can never be done in a house. We need to have that balance in mind. House to house and in the temple. These are the most essential elements in beginning. Finally, one is your teacher who's in heaven. Who are we going to get to be a teacher? We don't have this in heaven. Neither did the early Christians, but the apostles circulated letters that were read out. They had the Hebrew scriptures. They would still go to the synagogue and hear it. You got a Bible, read it. Today, in the age of internet, with so much good teaching as well as bad, it's not an issue or a problem, is it? He's with the Lord now, but my dear brother Dave Hunt, listen to him. He's like a father to me. Listen to him. There's no shortage of good food. After the scriptures, read the classics. The Pilgrim's Progress. The screw Tape Letters. Fox's Book of Martyrs. Those are the books after the scriptures we should be giving to young believers. There's no shortage of food. And in the age of internet, you can get teaching. You can watch a video. You can watch a film. House to house. But every once in a while, John Haller will be in town. Or Marco. Or Sandy Simpson. Or 
If you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel, Brother Jacob, you can meet in the temple. We can have a big meal. Leadership will emerge. Remember, Adonai Ro'i, Yahweh is my shepherd. Jesus saw the sheep without a shepherd in John, remember? Jesus is the pastor of every fellowship. It doesn't matter how big or how small, he's the pastor. The leader you see or the leaders you see, they're the assistant pastor. Jesus is the leader. There is no such thing as a fellowship without a pastor. He's there. His spirit is real and his word is there. Assistance will naturally emerge. Just be careful of the naysayers who want to take over with their agenda. Leaders will emerge. Leadership is only another function. Leadership in scripture is plural and relational and functional. It is not hierarchical apart from Christ. He is the head of the church. Leadership is plural, relational, and functional. That's all. Only Jesus has headship. Where are you going to go? We can't find the church. Where are we going to go? <laughs> Where did the early Methodists go? Where did the Baptists at first go? Where did the brethren go? Where did the early Christians go? Where can we go? If you can't find a good church, where should you go? Now, even if you do have a good church, the principle of house to house and in the temple still applies. That church should still have home groups. Remember, when persecution comes, that's going to be the only church there is. These buildings are going to go. You can't find the church? No, no, no. You can't find the building. Where can I go? That's the question I'm asked most. Where can I go? The answer? Go home. Thank you for listening.